Good morning. So how many of you were here last Sunday? Most of you? Do you remember that Reverend Sally, Deacon Sally preached on the Beatitudes, those blessings that Jesus was teaching the people um, on the Mount. We call it the Sermon of the Mount or the Beatitudes. And Sally's sermon was all about the new order that God has created, where those who mourn will be comforted, the meek will inherit the earth, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled, the merciful will receive mercy, the pure in heart will see God, the peacemakers will be called the children of God. And in her sermon, Jesus reminded us, or Jesus, in her sermon, Sally reminded us more than once of what Jesus does. Jesus turns everything upside down. The new order is not that the powerful and those in power will be at the top, rather those that are poor and those that are lonely, those that are sick, those that are on the outcasts or the outcasts and the, on the margins, they will be the ones lifted up. Everything will be turned upside down in Jesus's kingdom, the new order, which is not a time in the future. It is to be what we are working on today in the current part of our lives. And so this passage that we just heard about salt and light comes immediately after Jesus's teachings in the gospel of Matthew. We might even think it's the same crowd of followers that Jesus is talking to. And he drives home in this passage the point that the new order is about communal responsibility using these metaphors of salt and light. You see, for the Jewish community whom Jesus was speaking, they would know how important salt is to the community. It wasn't just something that you put on food as you were cooking or that you watch these chefs on TV put way more salt into anything than I ever think of using, um, partly because I do have high blood pressure. But other than that, they keep saying that salt brings out the flavor. But in the Jewish times, in the, for the Jewish people, salt was used just in lots of different ways as community sacrifices of animals. It was used to bind friendships and covenants. It wasn't just a sealing of the covenant. It was salt used to be able to sign and, and, and bind that covenant, that, that agreement together. And it was, of course, used to enhance food. But it was really salt was a symbol of community responsibility, of friendship, of sacrificing to please God. One of the authors I was researching wrote that in biblical days, friendship and loyalty was sealed with salt, probably something like a pinky swear. Salt was used instead of a pinky swear or, you know, the never mind. Um, but salt was also used as a preservative, which means that it was instrumental in making things last longer. There weren't any refrigerators or freezers. There was a need to keep that meat that was slain preserved for a longer time. So when we say a covenant of salt, or when Jesus is using the metaphor of salt, it simply means that it's something that is very, very important to the people he was talking to. It is also a perpetual covenant that cannot be broken, just as how salt preserves. It keeps things going for a long time. They were a vital part of a community with all of the blessings that he had said before, but they also needed to keep those commandments, those covenants between themselves and between their communities, and that they would be called great in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus shifts his parables or his metaphors to talk about light. Now, we look at light and we think it's everywhere. We just flip a switch and there's light, hopefully. But for Jesus's people, the people he was talking to, light was a flame. And you can see, and I didn't plan this, but one of our flames went out. And if that was the only flame that we had that was providing heat or light and it was dark, that would be a tragedy. We wouldn't see very well. We couldn't pull out our cell phones and turn on our flashlights. That wasn't true for people in Jesus's time. But light was something they had to keep going. They had to be working together to keep the light shining, the, the flames shining, the fires burning bright, the fires in their communities. And so Jesus is telling them, you need to work together to keep that light burning brightly because light is important to the world. And you, you, my friends, you who are listening to me are the light of the world. Like salt, light was a communal responsibility and people had to work together to keep that burning. 
as I said, we don't really have an appreciation of how deep these metaphors of light and salt meant to the people who Jesus was talking to. But think of it, we could maybe use a metaphor of, I don't know, food or, or energy. Um, everybody needs those things. And we are part of a community that hopefully will help bring those things to other people. Jesus says, let your light shine before others and don't put a bushel basket over it. He's saying it's not just about that thing that you want to cover up or the snuffer that we use at the end of the service to put out that candle. Jesus is saying we need to remove those barriers that, that prohibit our light from shining. Whether it's our own self-talk, we're not good enough, you should have done it this way, maybe if you had done this, this wouldn't have happened. All of those things are barriers to our light shining as individuals and also as community. So think of those things as you, as you ponder this sermon, because I know you will later in this day and this week. Think of those things that maybe diminish your light as individuals, but maybe diminish your light as family and try to work on putting that aside because our light as individuals and as community needs to shine. Now, I told you that we didn't need hymnals because Carolyn's not here, but I didn't tell you that um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to tell you about a story that, that I really do miss. When I was in Lake Ronkonkoma at St. Mary's way up there on Long Island, we had a preschool and the three and the four-year-olds would come and see Reverend Beth once a month. And usually I told them a story, but I also like to teach them songs. And I'm sure that you know this song, but we're going to sing it. And we're going to sing all three verses. So this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't put under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. We have to do the finger symbols too, right? Going to let anybody blow it out? No, I'm going to let it shine. Okay. So you know how it goes, right? Ready? Dale and Harper, do you know the song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Going to let anybody blow it out? No, I'm going to let it shine. Going to let anyone blow it out? No, I'm going to let it shine. Going to let anyone blow it out? No, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So now you have your earworm for today. And as you continue to ponder this sermon and how you want to let your light shine, how we at St. Nick's want to let our light shine, how we want to be salt of the earth, that song is just going to keep going through your head. And I'm really excited about that. But seriously, and I didn't plan for Carolyn to be sick so we could sing. It just was, I wasn't planning to sing, but since we're not singing today, I figured why not? But here's what it's really important is certainly our light and our love and our salt needs to be spread broadly around the world. Honestly, when we diminish, diminish our own light, we diminish our light of our communities. We fail to live in that covenant that God made with God's people for a perpetual and long lasting relationship of blessedness that we are blessed children of God and everyone is carrying that divine spark within them, whether they know it or not. And so our job is to help enliven that flame and to help people see their blessedness and their, their, their covenant with God, their life with God. And sadly, just two weeks ago, Tyree Nichols, you remember him from Memphis, a young man, 29 years old, a father, a son. What he loved to do as we've learned about his life, his light was destroyed by violence. We've learned about his life that he loved light. And he would go out and photograph. I hope you've seen some of his pictures. They're incredible. Light of sunrise and sunsets, all of the colors. There's a picture of him taking pictures of, of other people in shadows, 
black and white, light, darkness, and then pictures of, of the Memphis Bridge crossing, I think it's the Mississippi, it could be the Arkansas River, with the lights of that bridge shining brightly in all sorts of colors of the rainbow. His light was shining bright and his light was snuffed out through violence. My friends, we need to work hard as Christians and as people of God's light to make sure that that doesn't happen, whether it's through advocacy, whether it's through being involved in different organizations that are focused on reducing gun violence. It is, it is our call as God's people to make sure that Tyree and all of those who've had their lights destroyed through domestic violence or any kind of violence, that we shift that upside down from what it is becoming so normal in our lives and in our schools and in our communities. So shifting a bit to something a little bit more positive, Bob and I, as you heard last week, attended the first, the 128th annual convention, 128 years to the annual convention of the Diocese of Washington. That's a good long time. I feel like I've attended all of them, but I haven't. Um, but the theme for the convention was taking the next faithful step. And everything that had to do with convention was around that theme of taking that next faithful step especially coming out of COVID, what are we called to do as the Diocese of Washington, as St. Nicholas Episcopal Church, to take our next faithful steps? Bishop Marianne talked to us in her address about revitalizing the diocese's, diocese, diocese's commitment to grow in the Jesus movement in the way of love. And she highlighted strengths in ministry. And this week, I'll send you as long as you don't make comments, I'll send you the video that was done about St. Nicholas and St. Peter's in Poolsville and two other congregations in Montgomery County who are participating in this solar energy boot camp. Um, it was kind of remarkable to see how many churches are focused on God's creation. But we also talked about um, the need for the diocese to raise up experimental and innovative leadership and especially focusing on younger generations. There's an effort in the diocese to fund two new congregations made up predominantly of young people, meaning 20s and 30s and 40s, and focusing on where the population of these younger folks might be living. Where can we plant an Episcopal congregation? And then she also talked about addressing social equity and justice issues in our community. And I just spoke about gun violence. Um, that's one of the areas of concern. And how can we be impactful in both our communities and the country and the world? And then I was surprised and quite delighted to hear that she talked about assisting congregations with deferred maintenance and debt. There are a lot of old, old buildings. We're fortunate not to be an old, old building. We're barely a teenager. But there are lots of old, beautiful, historic churches that haven't been able to put any funds towards keeping their roof or their bricks pointed. And she talked about, although didn't get specific about that needs to be a focus in this coming year, how to take next faithful steps around deferred maintenance and debt. And we do fall into that second category. So my ears perked up and I said, Bob, to myself, we need to think about, we need to talk to the diocese and see what, what, what ideas they have, because our debt is a millstone around our neck. $5,000 a month. Imagine if you had to pay that. So as we think at St. Nick's, and we will be as your vestry and as your leadership, what are our next faithful steps that we need to take? I'm pleased to say, and we talked about this at the annual meeting, that we are closer than ever to the learning cottage, to the new, camp, the new building to be added to our campus to expand our meeting space, predominantly for Sunday school. We're getting close, my friends. Hallelujah is right. We're also very close to being able to talk about when the solar panels will be put on our roof. The folks have already been here. They've looked at our roof. They've given us the thumbs up. Jeff's working with the contractors to see when we can schedule that. And we will be able to enhance our green thumbprint in this part of Montgomery County by taking as much sun as we can to generate our own power and electricity. Last Sunday, you heard about the Gold Award Project and expanding and doubling the size of our garden so that we can donate more food to Nourish Now. I mean, there are so many wonderful things that 
your leadership over the years have taken faithful steps, including bringing this building to, to this location. It was a dream that has come true. And we're continuing to dream and to ask God to guide us and how we can be faithful in serving this community and building what needs to be for God's glory in this area of Montgomery County. So as you're singing my earworm song or the earworm song, it's not my song, it's your song now. As you're thinking about that, think about and listen for what the spirit is saying to you about how we as individuals and how we as St. Nick's can take our next faithful step because it's gonna involve all of us and it has involved all of us. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to spend money. That's not it at all. But take a faithful step and come tonight to the wine tasting. Take a next faithful step and volunteer for something, some ministry that you feel like you might want to learn more about. We all have a part to play to let our light shine and to be able to be the salt of the earth. So as we take the next faithful steps to be the salt and the light in this community, let us ask God to help us shine that new order brighter and tastier with more flavor and more spice. You know, we're allowed to be spicy Christians. We don't have to be a sedate and boring. We can be very excitable and very empowered and very filled with joy so that nothing will be able to extinguish or diminish our power of light and love and that we will continue to radiate and season our communities. May it be so. Amen.